Good afternoon, everybody, um, uh, from a deserted Hartford um, for our 11th John Donne lecture this year online, um, courtesy of uh, Susie Obak, who's kindly agreed to step in, uh, our IT department, and all of you who are Zooming in, and our development office, who, who Sarah Bridges, our development office, is holding the, holding the ring as our, as our chair. Um, it's a, it's a, an actually, it's a curiously appropriate um, subject for the lecture. Uh, Susie is a prolific author. Uh, I've lost count actually of the book she's written, leading therapist and uh, a kind of a, a national figure. Um, also an uh, uh, academic visitor here at, at Hartford. Um, and she's gonna be talking about you know, what to make of our bodies in this time when we're all living on Zoom and it's all dematerialized and actually this curious weirdness, this emptiness. Uh, and how amazing it is to look at Hartford. I mean, there's been nobody here all afternoon, just me and a porter. Um, so before we kick off, um, just uh, some kind of uh, how to organize ourselves. I'm gonna step out in a second or two. Um, while Susie's giving the lecture, she'll be addressing the camera. Um, if you have questions to ask her, um, rather than ask them to her directly, we can't do that. There's over 200 of you uh, kind of online at the moment. Um, what we'll do is, um, is we'll get you to um, group your questions, to put your questions in the chat function. Um, Sarah will group them and she will read them um, to Susie when we get to the Q&A. She's so going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes. I'll ask her a few questions at the end of it, in, uh, back in my study. And uh, with no more ado, over to Susie. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. And thank you, Will, for inviting me and all of you for tuning in. Um, I'm not sure I've accurately described what I'm going to say because when you write something, it turns out to be rather different. So I hope you'll accept that. When the lockdown started, I was confused by bodies on television. Why weren't they socially distancing? Didn't they know not to be so close? The injunction to be separate was unfamiliar and irregular. And for me, self-isolating alone, following this government directive was peculiar. It meant entering an alternative reality as though I were in a film or a novel. By now, the disjuncture has passed. I, like all of us, are accommodating to multiple corporeal realities. Bodies alone, bodies distant, bodies in the park to be avoided, bodies of disobedient youth, bodies in lines at shops, bodies in voices flattened on screen, and above all, bodies of dead health workers and carers. Black bodies, brown bodies, working class bodies, bodies not normally praised, now being celebrated. We're having to learn a whole new etiquette about bodies. In the 1870s, prosperous people learned to use the telephone. Until COVID, Many of us stopped using the phone, finding texting, email, and WhatsApp more suitable to our speeded up lives. And yet, we're coming to reuse it again and enjoy the sounds in our ears and the rhythm of conversation instead of feeling rushed and interrupted. In the week, as a psychoanalyst, I'm spend mostly spending my time looking into a screen. And like everyone else, I've been disconcerted by the oddness of catching sight of myself, a view I don't think we're meant to see. I've learned finally how to turn the view of myself off during sessions, but not today, sadly. Conversations in therapy defy most of the social customs or social, the customs of social intercourse. There are silences, repetitions, reframings, links across time, reminiscences of fragments, rushes of emotions, shards of dreams, things told and then disavowed. There's also some emphasis on how the dilemmas that beset the individual or the couple I'm seeing occur in our relationship too. 
Part of the work of psychoanalysis is that the conundrums that beset the analysand have an in vivo experience in the therapy relationship. The therapy relationship and the session is our petri dish. The field of examination is human subjectivity. A person fearful of intimacy can find the therapy relationship too present. Someone else who worries they're too needy tries to calibrate their longings within the therapy relationship. The work of therapy is to understand an individual's personal psychic language, to help her or him risk unlearning it as they remake their psychic structure anew. So too with the body. Those with troubled bodies bring those to the session. We find ways to live through a sense of bodilessness as they build a new body, a sustainable body. How is this dematerialization of bodies affecting us and going to affect us, me, my patients, you, all of us? For some of my patients, their screen or home is a prison. Their experience is full of woe and worry. Not for them, the diversion of sex toys whose sales have gone sky high during the epidemic. Therapy keeps them just about on the border of sane. But a sanity that hurts as isolation marauds their sense of self. So is there anything useful to say yet about this beyond my personal preoccupations, some of which have centered around the acquisition of a bodily sense of self? Bodies have always been bound and marked by social rules. Society makes meanings with bodies and bodily gestures. Where we, for instance, kiss to show affection, the Kayapo Indians in the Brazilian rainforest show their affection through bite. The variety of body adornment and transformations around the world, from rings around the neck and foot binding to constrain, to the recent upsurge in labial reductions and penis enlargements has made it ever more apparent that the body is not simply our DNA unfolding. The body is an outcome of the body-to-body -body relationship it has experienced, usually within the maternal orbit, where it apprehends forms of embodiment which can, like the psyche, the mind, be experienced on a continuum from stable and reliable albeit changing with age and growth, to unpredictable and fragile. The very few reports that we have of humans growing up outside of human culture, like Jean d'Averon, do not have bodies that resemble the human body. Jean's skin was tempered to the outdoors, and heat and cooled itself like the animals he grew up alongside. On seeing the snow, he threw off his clothes and ran outside. The body-to-body -body relationship, which was foundational for him, were the wolves. He mimicked their gaits and moves, their posture, and their vocalizations. Late modernity threatens the wide variety of bodies, or perhaps I should say bodily expressions. From screens and billboards, the ubiquity of the digitized Western body predominates, and surgery to insert, to insert 10 centimeter rods to lengthen Chinese legs, refashion noses in Tehran, re-sculpt cheekbones, breasts, calves in the West, and jawbones in South Korea, is now an international business with cosmetic surgery tourism hubs in Hungary, Korea, and Singapore, which were thriving until the lockdown. The Chinese phone app developed by Mechua allows the selfie and portrait taker to adjust their picture to three different degrees of beauty which are known as internet celebrity face, Wang Hon Liang. Five billion Wang Hon Liang images are uploaded each month. There is a significant beauty market. The two richest Europeans are not techies, but body merchants. Betancourt, who owns 30% of L'Oreal, and Otago, who owns Zara and many other brands. The labored over body, the body we produce through our labor, our exercise regimes, clothing, cosmetic, and food practices predominates, while the sweating, smelling, holding, stroking body of the other 
becomes for some more distant or in this moment of COVID-19, all too present. Close quarters with teenage boys as their smell changing is not relieved by their departure to school. All is on show for those in familial housemate groups, while hidden for those living alone. The experience of the body lived on screen and the pulsing, breathing, weeping, sighing, sighing tired, achy, or indeed springy and enthusiastic bodies we inhabit can be jarring. We no longer have social communion in the flesh. The handshake or hug, the pleasure of eating in a restaurant with a friend or a lover while seated near strangers. COVID eats the vital organ of those in difficulty. It warns us of its dangers as it collapses our social space. During the Second World War, Rennie Spitz looked at orphan babies in care. He discovered that those closest to the nurses station develop better than those at the end of the ward who failed to thrive. The difference was touch. The nurses would casually touch and interact with those infants closest to them, and this gave them the essential food for physical and psychological development. They absorbed the will to live. A decade later, in his now considered ethically controversial work in which he removed baby monkeys from their mothers, Harry Harlow discovered that baby monkeys only survived if they were given airs up mothers in the form of cloth monkeys near warm lights to cling on to. Those babies left on a warm wire floor, fed but deprived of their mothers, became highly disturbed and many died. Touch and feel and proximity are central to survival. Consider the genius of the premature infant's capacity to regulate their own and their parents' body temperature if they're held through kangarooing. The gaze, the search to be seen, to recognize and to influence the other is crucial to human subjectivity. In Tronic's The Still Face from 1975, he instructs a mother playing with her baby to refrain from interacting with her infant for 90 seconds. We observe as the infant girl desperately seeks to re-engage the mother. When she's unable to, she collapses psychologically and physically until contact is restored. What's so shocking is how fast the collapse is. And I've been thinking of how impossibly difficult and challenging life through the Zoom screen is, whether chatting with friends or being in a committee meeting. Conflict and harmony become cartoonish as the myriad of subtle gestures collapse and the meta conversations we have with our eyes is truncated. Terry Waite, John McCarthy and Brian Keenan have all written and spoken eloquently about, about solitary confinement and their struggle to find a way through and back, or should I say forward, to familial and social life. It was tough. And although many of us are not self-isolating alone, unless one is able to do interesting or valued work during this period or have enough people to hang out with, we can expect considerable psychological difficulties to follow. Unbusying oneself for many people has been an unknown. They've accelerated their productiveness, whether in the academy or attending to aged parents and children, working many jobs. Enforced pulling back feels, or at least beginning, felt alien. One's skin, one's sense of self may not fit, and it may have taken a while to grow resources, to nourish one's appetites and accept new realities, devoid of busyness, touch and gaze. So far, I've talked about the private body. Today, there is now a frightened, wary social body. A body that is tense, in which avoidance is the watchword. Where once the hoodie or the burqa might alarm, it now offers reassurance. Meanwhile, we admire whole new bodies, the bodies of working women, carers go in and out of the houses and homes of the people they look after. We notice the vast numbers of raced bodies, particularly in the health service, who are finally recognized for their incredible value and the shockingly disproportionate number of their losses. 
We see the delivery men, transport workers, small shopkeepers, often first generation immigrants, the workers in food production and delivery. We see a different social landscape. Before COVID, the ruling party were happy to slash social and health funding, to put money into management in the NHS and not into professional carers, doctors and nurses. Now society is waking up to the value of care and medical expertise, which comes from the hospital floor. That's to say, doctors, doctors and nurses who are reorganizing what occurs there. The people who are keeping society going in every sector are not who we were led to think they were. The opportunity for rephrasing how we represent the social body, the body and society is changing. It is of necessity differently hued, and we must live with the shame of our previous marginalizing. COVID-19 is cleaning the lens so we can see more clearly. I've talked some about the individual body and how it's been challenged by COVID. I've also talked about the challenges to how we've seen the social body. I'd now like to talk about the corporate body, the body of state, and what we've been learning about how it's functioned. On April 17th, just a week ago, Professor Anthony Costello, former director of the Institute of Global Health at UCL, told the Select Committee on Health and Social Care that he feared Britain might have the highest number of deaths in Europe. He estimated 40,000 which according to the FT on Wednesday of this week, we have now surpassed. He argued this figure because we were slow off the mark and behind countries who took serious cautionary moves early on. He spoke to the chair of the committee, Jeremy Hunt, who spent this period appearing to stress about the lack of testing, ventilators and PPE equipment. The same Mr. Hunt, who is the longest serving health secretary also had social care in his portfolio and the pay of doctors and nurses, but more damningly was the minister in charge during Operation Cygnus, a UK government's exercise carried out in 2016 to look at preparedness for an epidemic declared to be a global pandemic by the WHO. The very scenario we actually have now. Operation Cygnus collapsed sometime into the exercise when it was realized that our government was unprepared for such an eventuality. Like a war game, governments run test, run test drills. But what shocked COBRA and the ministers who were part of Cygnus was the nation's extreme unpreparedness. In this exercise, despite the epidemic having not arrived, local resilience forums, which is to say hospitals and mortuaries across the country, were overwhelmed. <clears throat> there was insufficient PPE for doctors and nurses. The NHS was about to fall over from lack of ventilators and critical care beds. Morgues were set to overflow and government emergency messages, which were unspecified in the Cygnus exercise, were not getting traction. Modeling for this exercise was the same Imperial College team tracking and modeling today's epidemic. The Cygnus exercise showed holes in the EPRR, the Emergency Prepared Resilience and Response Plan. Cygnus and other such exercises are meant to prepare government, not as Jeremy Hunt was doing, cutting beds. On March 28th of this year, when Cygnus came to light, we were told that rejections were not remedied because of worries that beds, ventilators and PPP PPE would become outmoded or obsolete and that governments in any case had worked on securing reliable supply chains. Collective health security was disregarded. A 2018 Red Cross conference report on sickness and infectious disease stated, the financial and human cost of an outbreak can be staggering and early response reduces the cost. The financial costs are twofold. The cost to fight an outbreak break and the loss to the national and sometimes closed global economy. The Fund for Peace, which publishes the annual Fragile States Index, originally called Failed States, this four criteria for a failed state. 
I imagine you will think this is far-fetched, but I think we've come dangerously close to fulfilling two of the criteria, especially after running Cygnus and not stepping up to the EPRR, the Emergency Preparedness and Resilience Response. These two criteria are the inability to provide public services and the inability to interact with other states as a full member of the international community. As this week's farce has unfolded from the alleged missing communications with EU on procurement to the belated show of interest on March 19th to the failure to attend a meeting of health officials on March 29th to the newly declared and then denied statements that this was a political decision to not cooperate with the EU, I think we meet criteria. Then there's the farce over testing with Dominic Raab and Matt Hancock reassuring us that we're on target for testing by the end of the month. Two issues here, which you know well, the capacity for testing, which is very different from the administering of tests and the test reliability. In common parlance, this stance on the part of the government relies on magical thinking. In my profession, we call this delusional. There is too the hubris over the plans to design new ventilator machines by British companies, which the Financial Times detailed last weekend. Our government chose to source new ideas rather than to build to the existing plan under existing plans under license. Why, one must ask. Could it be Brexit hubris? I don't want to set the UK against the EU because the original wrangling over the ECB and the Eurozone in which Christine Lagarde did not want to manage its least debt and Angela Merkel was reputed not to want to either was short-sighted. As Farrafarkas has argued, the Euro allowed German products to be bought in Eurozone countries, thus sustaining the, 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 German, the Euro, German economy over the last decades. Ethics of cooperation in Europe and the ethics of transparency and honesty have been mightily tested in the past months. If we now turn to the bodies of state, the hidden nature of who sits on SAGE is troubling. Government rationale that members will be harassed or lobbied if named doesn't really hold up. Why can't we know who they are? Which infectious disease doctors, which intensive care specialists and nurses, nurses, which immunologists, which virologists, which scientists working on vaccines, which health policy planners, who from the joint forces? I'm sorry if I sound shrill, but this is a matter of life and death. If we look at the state and the citizen, the UK has the lowest level in Europe of repatriating citizens stranded abroad, abroad in this period. Four in 10 of the 165,000 Europeans stranded around the world by UK nationals. The UK has chartered just six flights by, via the U EU crisis scheme, bringing a thousand Britons home. Germany, in comparison, has organized 1,010 such flights, repatriating nearly 22,000 citizens with Euro cash. Is this another example of ideology? About 65,000 UK nationals are still in need of repatriation. I'm not sure how we characterize the following failure of the state because it speaks to citizens as member of, of a state it believes functions and is undoubtedly the expression of public good. But I'm sure others will have been alarmed by the fact that 750,000 people signed up to help, invited by the government, and, those, and out of those, only 20,000 have been deployed. Citizens, us, want to contribute. This squandering of people's generation, generosity, is disturbing. Fortunately, people like Captain Tom Moore and the many making masks and contributing 3D printers keep going. Fortunately, the program Feed NHS, which the Chain Leons and other chefs are prepping to feed patients, doctors, nurses, hospital porters and ambulance workers, is now in train. This voluntary work in which groups of people self-organize is outstanding, and yet it contrasts with the inability of our state to mobilize those who want to help. <coughs> I need to drink. My body's in need of water.
not in our country, but across the ocean, the contribution of the Gates Foundation to seven different vaccine programs, and Twitter's Jack Dorsey's contribution of several billion dollars, 28% of his income to the emergency, is impressive. <clears throat> the US, in the absence of a state that can be relied on, has always had a history of philanthropy. And I wonder whether the hedge funds in the UK, such as Rutter Investment, which made 2.4 billion betting on market moves and pocketed a profit of 4,144% in March, or Somerset Capital, the hedge fund that used to involve Reese Mogg, who state on their website that they say COVID as a once in a generation opportunity for investment, I presume, and who brought in two new stock positions. One, the Brazilian hospital operator, Havida, and the other, the South African pharmacy chain, Lynx. I wonder whether they will be contributing their obscene profits back to the state, or will their tax status protect their, yes, immoral earnings? Do we think it would be possible to persuade Rutter and Somerset and the other 49 hedge funds with assets under management of at least a billion to plug the hole in the economy, underwrite extra pay for hospital workers? Not the man who I see have already been granted or granted themselves a 30 to 50% overtime rate. Do we think the mood of the country could be such that hedge funders and managers would be persuaded to to contribute to increased remuneration for carers, drivers, shop workers, the so-called unskilled, who are too poor to be let into the country under current immigration rules. COVID is a sad story. It's also a story of resilience. The body of the state has failed us. We need to grow up and recognize that. It really isn't good enough. It's not that the individuals are bad or inadequate, but we have systemic failure from the reduction in the status of civil servants to the downgrading of health workers, to the racism and microaggressions, the control of teachers in a managerial economy, which is now being upturned in the hospital, thank goodness, because of the necessity of doctors and nurses having to run the show. And to return to our bodies, the alive ones, now for so many devoid of touch and gaze, facing a long period of isolation, and still frightened. How can I conclude? In a way, I can't conclude because we're far from the other side of this crisis. What I've understood is that the psychological therapies are going to have a huge part to play in the remaking of body and soul. I think that's what John Dunn was thinking about himself. I'm not a personal fan of the word trauma because it's become so overused. But we are, in a, we are a society that is in trauma. To some extent, the societal trauma gives opportunities for people to go through, things, go through things together rather than suffer alone, if we don't bury or make light of what we've been going through. We will have to find new ways to with, live with our fears and discomforts, with what we project onto other people's bodies and the fears we have about our own vulnerabilities. We will need all the help we can get in reshaping our relationship to ours and each other's bodies to find a way to build bonds of attachment and respect for all bodies. What started with the dematerialization of the individual body has now morphed into the dematerialization of the body of state. We should pay attention to the words of Joseph Stieglitz, who reminds us that with the stripping back of the state under Reagan and Thatcher, we lost capacity. This needs to be addressed. The cost to the exchequer of universal credit, underwriting 80% for companies, furloughing, etc., is so far in the region of 250 billion. According to the National Audit Office, the most conservative figure from the 2008 bank bailout was 850 billion. I think Will will correct me, this, this wasn't all spent in one go, but I found the NAO's report and Paul Johnson of the IFS's comments interesting. We're at crisis levels, 
but we've been there before. According to General Sir Richard Barons, we're at 100% of GDP spend so far in this crisis. He says that in the war, we went to 250% of GDP. So we aren't broke yet. Again, I will need Will's comments on that. But Barron's was making this point to talk about the capacity in the system, and we should heed that. We began the makings of a very different kind of society after World War II. We will have to do that again with a new creativity, with the recognition of the contributions and the losses, particularly of our ethnic and working class people, and the problematic ways in which our governments have shamed themselves through creating divisions in society, particularly since austerity. The outpourings of artists, musicians, graphic designers, programmers, comics, cultural and scientific workers at all levels has been outstanding. The talent, the will, the desire is there to remake our world. The urgency is not in question. Globalism will need to be recast as mutuality, local and global mutuality. So we learn from each other, including those who've been locked down in war zones and other difficulties. Globalism can't just be a celebration of just-in-time deliveries. Our institutions will need to be rebuilt with transparency and with heart, and with learning from the people who've been staffing them, not just the managers and the owners. Doctors, nurses, carers, delivery people have things to say about how to run their institutions better. The body politics and the politics of the body that make up our world must be reconfigured and we need to start thinking about that now. I can include with Freud, as you might have expected. He wrote, the aim of psychoanalysis is to turn hysteria into ordinary human unhappiness, close quote. That is an accomplishment for an individual and for a society. We can't escape unhappiness. It's constitutive of being human just as our creativity, courage, ambition, attachment, and love. Let's embrace the complexity of what it means to be human in this time of sorrow, as we think and feel our way through to come out of this wiser, humbler, more connected, and cleverer. Thank you very much. Um, hello. 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 Well, what a a human story. being. A human being. No, no, no. There's a human being here. Human being listening to all of that. Extraordinary. Um, what I what I didn't um, expect you to do, and which uh, you know is really intriguing, is to link um, the kind of personal trauma um of uh how we kind of relate to our bodies and one to another with actually kind of a jump across to um uh companies and then another jump across um to to um to public bodies and what it, i mean i i mean uh and while you were talking i had you know 101 thoughts I mean, just to pick up on your challenge about the cost of this, and, uh, and, then, and then I want to come back to bodies. I mean, the cost of this, um, compared with the financial crisis, um, that 850 billion figure from 2008-9 was um, in part um, quantitative easing, in part guarantees to the banking system, and in part new capital to the banking system. It was slightly apples and pears. If you do the same with that, we're already well over that number. Um, the Bank of England has, um, given 350 billion of quantitative easing and more. Um, the government is committed to a 330 billion business continuity um, loan package and more. Um, then there's the, the, the direct fiscal impact, which is going to be the 250 billion you mentioned. We're already, we're already you know, through a trillion and heading north. I mean, it is um, one of the most profound, um, uh, one of the most profound, um, economic crisis I've ever lived through um, uh, and actually I want to and I've got two questions I want to put to you before throwing it open to others um, because one of the things that's worrying a lot of people um, at the top of government um, 
uh, in, in us the commentary at, you know, is actually the scarring effect of this. And actually, I'd be very interested to hear what your kind of reflections are on that. But before I get to that, I just want to kind of go to pick up um, your, the first remarks in your kind of remarkable lecture. Uh, and thanks, by the way, Susie. Uh, a lot of work goes into that. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> you know, um, um, uh, and it was when you were talking about the, I mean, I was completely unaware, um, and perhaps I should have been aware of the kind of tourism industry, this, cosm this, cos this cosmetic tourism industry. And I was completely unaware that the richest people in Europe were Betancourt and Cor Natago. Um, and, I, I, and I guess I want to pick up on that. I mean, well, I think that's that's to do with. I I would have thought you'd have liked that because a lot of people. I like, I like that. Things. I like that thought, but I want you to develop it. I mean. Well, I, I, I okay, I've written a whole book about it, but I mean, I think it's my argument there is that our bodies no longer make things; we make our body. Our body has become something we produce, and that the industries that run on that are not small industries; they are huge. They are really seriously huge. Cosmetic surgery is tiny compared to the beauty and fashion industries. And we know how destructive the fashion industry is, not, not just, and the food industry, obviously the diet industry. We know how enormous the fashion industry uh, and, and how seriously troubling it is to the environment because there's been a lot of work on that that's come to light recently. So I don't know. I'd come and give you a seminar on that another no, time. No, but what I wanted just to do, just what, what I thought about when you were talking was, um, do you think that when we get back to some semblance of normality, that people will, will want to really re-embrace um, their bodies? And actually, that, that a lot of things that are being turbocharged by this, both negatively and positively, negative things are being tur turbocharged, uh, um, the decline of the high street, for example. I mean, that's been turbocharged um, for the worse. But what might be turbocharged when we get back to normal is actually people saying, whoa, I want to re-embrace my body. I'm going to, I'm going to you know, really want to cosmetically alter it in a way that I never would have dreamt of before. I've only got a few years left. I want to play with my body in a way that was denied me during the lockdown. Well, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with that. Well, I was pretty sure you were going to go with like, much more naturalistic, re-engaging um, re with the body. But that's an interesting question. I, I think it's very disturbing. It's, it's pretty much, I, I, it's a very fast growing industry, the, the, the transformational body industry. Um, and I don't even know how much more capacity there is. I mean, one of the big countries for it is China. It's, it's absolutely huge. Um, I mean, we're, we're pipsqueaks compared to the rest of the world, frankly. But I don't know. I see, I, I suppose I was, I was hoping you'd say, well, what kind of things do you think will happen that may allow people to feel that the body as a body is something that needs re-embracing? And I was then going to give you a whole rap about body activists, but no. <laughs> you, you well, no, I'm, me. Just, I'm just, I mean, I just, I mean, I'm, I went, I, went, I went with the dark side, but take me, yeah, to the light you're right side. To. take me to the take me to the light side. I mean, it would be. I mean, I it would be. I mean, a, a lot of us are doing more exercise, taking eating a bit less, taking care of our bodies in this period of drinking more. I mean, are we? I mean, is that a maybe? That is a way it could go. Another way it could go. Yeah, I think that's been interesting. I think the way that it this is a way it could go. I I mean, I don't think. <laughs> Disciplining the body is, uh, is, is the response either. I, I think we need a whole different kind of discussion about what, it me what forms of embodiment um, we can have. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I can give you a, a, quick, a quick answer on that. One, another thing that occurred to me while you were talking, and, I, and I've been thinking about this quite a lot, um, uh, is whether you think, um, because what's been very striking is the public support for the lockdown, um, very, very high public support for the lockdown. People really, uh, uh, and young people, you know, who are less, who are less at risk, you know, really want to stand shoulder to shoulder with their elder peers. Um, and there's, but we're going to have to live with more risk 
if we're going to get back to normality, I think. I mean, will there okay. be contact? There'll be contact tracing, there'll be vaccines, but actually there'll be more risk. Um, if it, and if we don't accept more risk, um, we're not going to get back to any kind of normal life. Are we ready to do that as a society? Well, I, I've been really noticing, and I, I, I wonder what other people think about this, about the fact that this week we've seen such a huge push and so many different voices, some from the back benches and some from columnists about how we have to get back to normal life. This isn't, we can't keep doing this. This is not okay. And what are the, what are the plans for coming out of lockdown? All of which sound eminently um, important. I, 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 do, I do understand that. But I also wonder why those are coming up exactly right now. I wonder whether there isn't a different agenda when people are talking, they're not really talking mental health, they're talking economy. And part of me wonders about that issue, is that what is driving this gets back? Is it, is it, is it that people are so scared of the economy? Or, or what, what do you think it is? Oh, I mean, I know I accept your question, which I haven't answered. I think we will have to accept risk. Life is risk. And it, it will be very interesting to look at different countries and how they've managed risk. If you count furloughed workers, by the end of June, Britain's unemployment <laughs> level will be 6 million. Uh, if you count furloughed workers as unemployed, which you really should do. Um, if um, the recovery, um, if, if there isn't a snapback um, to um, you know, relatively normal levels of economic activity um, in the second half of the year, unemployment will carry on rising. I mean, I've seen numbers, if you include furloughed workers, you know, as high as seven, eight, nine million. Um, and you can also kind of, uh, and this is, this is happening, by the way, internationally. I mean, you know, the numbers, yeah, in the yeah. state, and the numbers in the States are just as worrying. I mean, you know, more than 30 million people claiming unemployment benefit in the States. I mean, wow. I mean, these are figures that surpass and what we saw in 1931. Yeah, okay, Will, but what about, isn't this an opportunity for thinking about how to redistribute labor? I mean, I'm somebody who comes from second wave feminism. My generation fought very hard to have parental leave, to have sh shorter working hours, to have a family life, to have domestic labor shared, to have contributions to public space shared. And it could never be done under the conditions of turbocharged late capital. It just couldn't. No, no, no. So yes, of course, of course, we, we have a, 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 the reconfiguring of labor that needs to be put on the agenda. A, what the hell we're going to be making, and B, who's going to do that work and how it's going to be parceled out. But I don't think we should be thinking about old economic models. There's been a lot of work. I know you know all of this work <laughs> on a social, on, on giving people not just a living wage, but on making something rather different about how people make contributions in society and how they have economic security, even if it's at a lower level. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean and my last question before we throw it open to the, uh, to the questions that I see bring it, we're really going to mount up now. I mean, um, uh, it's about the new normal. I mean, I have an idea about what I think the new normal um, will look like. I mean, I, I mean, uh, you know, I've been, you know, championing stakeholder capitalism for the last 25 years. I know. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, um, and I intend to put my shoulder to the wheel in actually trying to make that happen. Um, and there's a there's growing acceptance, I think, by a lot of companies that that's going to be the direction of travel. We've got to we've got to reframe, I think, uh, the, the the entire deal for um, 16 to 35 year olds. I really, for example, I think they're asking people to take the amount of student debt into an economy which is going to be as depressed as the economy is likely to be over the next five, six, seven years. Is really it's it's an it's an ask too far now. So we have to reframe the settlement for our 18 to 35 year olds. And then there's all the points you raised in your lecture. I mean, and what I suppose I, I, I would love, and I, I'm reaching for it and I can't quite um, get the words right, but there, there was without doubt a connection between, you know, what we're all thinking and the sense we're trying to make of this lockdown and our approach to risk and our, and our solidaristic feelings towards one another and actually how that will you know, help to be the culture that constructs this new order that I think is emerging. 
I mean, do you see that? And, and how do you think it'll pan out? Look, I think we've had a lot of very frightened people before COVID. I think people frightened about losing their jobs, working too many jobs. I think whether that's been at the level of people on three or four different jobs because they can't make ends meet, or even academics who are under extreme pressure, or doctors. I mean, there's so many people who've been working as though we're in a very frightening place all the time. And part of what, for some of us, this, this has done is to allow us to rethink a little bit about priorities and time. But I do think it is an opportunity to really think about what jobs need doing and how are we going to share them, Will? I think if you're thinking about restructuring the state and restructuring work, which is your topic, part of that has to be redistribution of work. We don't have, we, we lost 10,000 nurses. There, we may need not to charge them for training. I mean, we need to have more nurses. We need to have more people being supported in the arts. We need, we need the things that make it possible to live in a society rather than feel frightened in society. So we got, we've got a new fright, which is COVID, but we were already a very frightened society out of which was born div divisiveness and a lot of hatred in the last few years. You've also got a very frightened cabinet. I mean, they were elected, uh, 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 the, the Conservative cabinet were elected to implement Brexit. And you know, the amount of cognitive dissonance, the amount of psychic stress that these guys, when these men were under, because suddenly they find themselves, it's logistics, it's procurement, it's public service delivery, it's manufacturing, it's resilience. And then after that, there's shaping the recovery, um, managing um, some kind of recovery and, um, and accepting that there will have to be higher taxes, that there will have to be better public services, that there will have to be some kind of program of the type that you've talked about. And they're not stupid and they can see it. And yet, you know, all their thought categories are kind of locked into a kind of um, 2019 world in which you were fighting for Brexit. You know, and they, and I mean, that, I mean, you're a therapist. I mean, these, these people, I mean, I, I sometimes see Yeah, but if you're a therapist, you, one thinks of that as a kind of splitting category. You know, one splits off what one can't deal with and goes for what one thinks one can deal with, which is Brexit, which is, which is that form of um, behavior and you repress what you can't deal with. And what you're saying is, they've now got everything that was repressed coming in their face and they don't have the capacity to deal with it. Because they haven't exactly thought about it. That's exactly what I'm saying. I think actually they're, they're dead men and women is my view. I mean, I think it's exactly like the ERM crisis in 1992, September 92. It was absolutely obvious that John Major's government was blown out of the water. And I think it's actually obvious that Johnson's government is blown out of the water. Um, I think it's a very yeah. interesting plan. Anyway, look, there's lots and lots of questions. There's lots of okay. lots of questions. I can see that, and I, I'm hoping that Sarah has grouped them for you. Um, well, okay, it doesn't matter. Close me down, but I will say goodbye to you at the very end, and I'll be listening okay. in. Okay? okay, more questions coming to you. Hi, Leslie. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello. Um, one minute. I'll just try and bring on my video. There we go. Um, Will, do you want to stick around for this, or um, would Sorry? you like me to take off your video? I think I, I think it's distracting. I'll take off my video, but I will be sure. listening. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, as Will said, I've tried to group them into uh, personal body, social body, and uh, governmental body. Um, that was when the talk was going on. I think a few more questions seem to be coming in as we go. So I'll start with the first few grouped, and then we might just okay. have to go around a bit. Um, I so just like to say my body is so hot because I had to find a room in which there be, would be no sunlight and, and which wouldn't make the echo. And I'm now very, very hot, so I'm just drinking lots of water. <laughs> well, you're doing a fantastic job, and the talk was fantastic. Thank you so much. We, um, I know in the development office, we've all been really enjoying it. Um, so uh, on the personal body, we'll start with. Um, so the first question is from uh, Christopher Wallen. What happens when we come out of lockdown, but into a new socially distanced normal? Will the impact of not being able to hug or be close to each other in person be worse than having to communicate through a screen? It's such a good question, isn't it? Because I think we don't know. I think we will, we will discover that and then we'll have to think and theorise it and find ways of managing it. I, I think it's a great question. Um, and I'm sure we'll break it. I don't think we'll be able to manage it, frankly, because 
we'll be back in our different roles and we will be wanting to make be wanting to touch because gesture and touch are so critical and i don't think we can do it all with eyes i totally agree yeah. <laughs> i'm no psychoanalyst but <laughs> yeah um, i don't think you I don't think you need to be one to answer that <laughs> Uh, so the next question is from Olga. Um, do you think the new norms of social distancing and lack of physical interaction will stay with us beyond the time when COVID-19 is no longer a danger? And will our habits return back to normal or have we already adopted new ways of social interaction for the future? I think it really depends how long we're locked down or which groups are locked down. I think we're going to be very uptight for a while. And... Uh, we're going to be nervous and unless we talk about it and address it and find ways of making jokes about it just like people have created most incredible um wonderful jokes and, and videos now i think we'll have to do that kind of thing in order to socialize what's actually happening to each of us individually mm -hmm. people coming out of uh war trauma and uh, particularly when rape of war who were not able to talk about it really suffered much more than when you could provoke conversation about that as a weapon of war so, and the adjustment that you have to make so i know that's a very extreme example but we do know talking helps mm -hmm. um we got one from uh, monique here what does Susie think about the cult of productivity in the midst of the t uh, pandemic, i.e. the idea that we should be writing novels, etc., during our extra time? I can really sympathise with that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think there have been so many different responses. One of my friends um, took up painting, learnt a new language, and, um, and she's very productive anyway. Whereas for, for a lot of us, I don't think we found it so exhausting to deal with the new reality that time just evaporated that we weren't even able to escape it. But the idea of adding in extra capacity or adding extra activity is very diff difficult. Um, I think any of these kind of moral strictures to, to, to self-improve at this time are kind of crazy really. We don't need to be. Mm -hmm. if, if we find that we have the desire then maybe we should how we can allow that rather than interrupt it. But I don't think we need a whole set of rules um, beyond trying. I think it's probably worth getting dressed. <laughs> that is a, a reasonably good thing to do. And it's probably worth getting some fresh air and it's probably worth talking to people. But apart from that, I don't, I don't think having to be super productive is an answer for everybody. I think that's probably reassuring for everyone to hear. Um, on the flip side of that, there's an interesting question from Eloise here. Do you think that there'll be a new appreciation for stillness in the new norm and new role for it in the future economy? I think that's a fabulous wish. It's, it's for some people, well, for so many people, the capacity to reflect, people taking up yoga or meditation or drawing whatever it is something that is of a different nature i think is or cooking because a lot of people don't don't chop vegetables I, I think that stillness and that different relation it would be terrible for people to lose that that's partly why i think we have to redistribute really work again so because so otherwise we're going to be backing the over, overworkers and the people who don't have enough to do and instead of taking advantage of what we've actually been offered and, and we've had such magnificent weather that i think it's helped the stillness is, issue actually nature's been very kind to us on this account and i think to lose that would be very very upsetting it would be an absolute travesty really mm -hmm. Um, so moving now on to the social body, and as I say, I might have some personal body questions coming up later. Um, this is sort of how I've grouped them so far. Um, so a question from Jason here. Is it dangerous that we're starting to treat the NHS as a charity, for example, asking for volunteers and fundraisers? And are we prepare, uh, being prepared for a privatised health service? Well, I think we've been prepared for privatised health service for quite a long time now, if you look at the number of 
IP practices that are owned by, by private companies and the kinds of profits they're taking out of them, let alone what Virgin or who other who provide the kind of easy, whether it's the sports medicine or the MRIs or whatever, that, that we, it, that's already happened. Um, that's more worrying to me than the charities, which I think this speaks to people's wish to make a contribution, although I put them up in a kind of household that thought charity was a way of avoiding what actually were the responsibilities of, of government. So I understand that argument. Um, I, I think I'm very worried about the privatization of the health service. You only have to look at um, Gove's statement about it. Uh, I don't, don't know, if, quite a few cabinet ministers put it about it. But you know, if there's a long history of sending um, our civil servants to America, to the health corporation of America, to learn how to a service and a lot of those managerial um, interventions have actually taken away a lot of the power from health workers and yes I'm very very deeply worried about it we need to fight about that we really really need to fight about it mm. and sort of on, on the same vein um, a question from Sarah here will the social attitudes really change so as to value of key workers um, i.e. will we pay them properly, resource them properly, etc. Fundamentally, will we have to pay more in taxes, supermarket prices and so on? Won't we just forget and go back to normal um, as capitalism starts to operate normally again? Or will the capitalist system be fundamentally changed so as to correct this? And Here's even the thing you and about I... Being just... a... Here's the thing about being a psychoanalyst. You look at the heart, you know, everything. So I agree that we're going to have a battle about I don't think it's clear which way this will run out, but we do have countries that have more social democratic forms of, of government and we've gone so drastically over the last, since, since 79, 80, so drastically towards the notion of the individual rather than contribution being critical and the production itself being what matters. That there will be a tangle about this. It's by no means clear which way we'll go. I think if, if Will is right and this government is dead, the question is, can we have the kind of grown up public conversation that says, how do we re-engage as a country? A proper, a proper form of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, there's one here from R. Darren Paul. Um, it says, I'm a doctor, child and, adoles um, and adolescent psychiatrist in emergency medicine. Could you speak more about the escalated fear of bodies and almost paranoia among some in attempting to enforce social distancing in public? It's a really interesting question because are we is what's joining up there our own body instability with which which has been created since we've made bodies a, a place of work so to speak, and of, of decoration in this extreme way that I was mentioning. So on the one hand, is, is it that joining up with other bodies as being dangerous? So we've got our own bodies are dangerous and we've got other bodies being dangerous. How are we going to change the narrative and the feeling that bodies are both bad that they are not one thing or the other they have both incredible strengths but they also have vulnerabilities and i think it's a it's a much bigger question about vulnerability in general that you're raising that we have never sanctioned in our society and we certainly don't sanction in relation to bodies we either hate the bodies that we don't like whether they're our own or the bodies that society has said not nice kind of bodies but we don't actually recognize the body is having its own vulnerabilities and its own needs and its own strengths as a result. So I think that's the kind of conversation I'd want to be having with young people and with older people. Okay, um, so we're now going to move on to governmental body, so a few more political questions here. Um, so first of all, this is from uh, an anonymous attendee, do you think the British response to COVID-19 would have been better uh, should we have remained in the EU? I think so. I do think so, yes, because 
I, I think this is where Gordon Brown is absolutely right about the financial crisis. You need an international body to be operating in concert. And we were part of an international body with all its incredible flaws. So to be out on the margins and to kind of be headless at this particular moment, even though we're actually still in it for another minute or two, it, it seems quite crazy. And that's why it's so confusing about what's happened in terms of the, the, the inability to join procurements. And I think there are different examples within Europe and different choices that we could have been considering in a different way. So yes, I think the lack of uh, mutual conversation about different approaches was very damaging. And another interesting one. Um, so Catherine asks, Susie, leaving aside general incompetence and stupidity, are there, other, <laughs> are there useful ways of understanding the failures of the UK government in a psychoanalytical sense beyond categorizing them as delusional? In the US context, it seems easier to recognize in Trump and for instance, the governor of the state of Georgia, a world refusal or inability to confront the problem of the pain of others. Do you see this in play in this country too? Actually, I don't. I don't think there's been a refusal to see the pain of others. I, that, that hasn't, but I, what was the question? I do think there's been a lot of stupidity, yes. Um, but from a psychoanalytic perspective, I think there's a lot of repression, a lot of not, not, not have being absolutely ignorant because it's been possible not to know about other people eventually gets solidified as a form of, of not knowing and repression or we've been living in silos one of, one of the collapses of social democracy and and the emergence of um culture played on through screens is that we've lived in silos and that's been true for governments as well so that we we've disregarded all sorts of opinions and people and and yes i think it is there that kind of splitting mechanism is something that psychoanalysis is very very familiar with somebody comes in and they says they say i'm this kind of person or, and they're that kind of person but the whole job of psychoanalysis is to get to know the parts of you that you disavow that are complicated that you don't like so much that you have best in other people and to find a way of managing complexity. I mean, I've always thought that we've needed practical analysts to, to sit on the government job, not to explain what, not psychoanalyze ministers, but to understand why people do things that are not in their own best interests, mm -hmm. what it is that makes people mess up. Because people are doing something they think is in their own interests or not in their own interests for very substantial reasons. But those are often unconscious processes, which if we understood, we could help much better. Like, for example, why women go back, battered women go back to, to unfortunate and terrible relationships. They do it because they think they can make them better. They don't do it because they're idiots. They, they do it as a form of agency, for example. I'm being very, very quick in my explanation. Mm. So I think Psychoanalysis has a, a role to play within government, very substantial role actually, because it's a very different form of research about, and it understands people in the process of change. Mm. And I think that's something we're, we're really seeing now. Um, so this is quite a long one, but it's an interesting uh, question here, um, again from uh, anonymous attendee. As someone who lives in Greece and has volunteered with the refugee population, I can see how, especially once the lockdown eases, the pandemic will be used to increase the sense of otherness of refugees. They will have the increased infection rates relative to the general population since they're cooped up in camps and necessarily, uh, and necessarily cannot observe lockdown like the rest of us. How do we tread the line between advocating for embracing everyone's right to embodiment and being and right to be in the face of perceived and potentially actual increased risk of contagion? E.g. if I see someone of my refugee clients, I may be perceived as taking undue risk and have to go into self-isolation again and not back to my own work. Well, it's a really important question because we, in our othering, in, in our social, our global inequality, and um, we haven't seen anything yet, as we all know, because of climate crisis, let alone what this crisis is doing. This othering has been very, very dangerous. And the, the, the fact that 
people end up in Greece dispossessed and are unable to get quite what they need, even though there are some fantastic projects. Um, is obviously going to put stress on the on the workers. So how do you have that conversation with them? How do you have the conversation in a in an economy that is all already on its knees, in which the EU, the price it exacted for the bailout was so horrendous that it made it impossible for people to feel generous towards themselves, let alone anybody else. So I I I think it is a very, very difficult and profound question um, and it has to become a whole society question. It cannot be the question, it cannot be the answer only of the refugee workers. That's really not right. Mm -hmm. No, I think, yeah, a really, really tricky one to answer. Um, so we've just got a couple more left. They um, don't really fall into any of the categories, so I'll just uh, go through them. Um, first of all, from Simon. Can we talk a bit about international and intergenerational fairness? Should the first Oxford safe vaccine go to an 80 year old Brit or an African child? Well, you know what? It's not going to be an one to get it. So I don't think that's a good question. I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, it's a great question, but I wouldn't know how to answer it. <laughs> and we are going to be, you know, we're going to be producing that in large quantities. And that is a conversation to be had. It isn't how do you how do you have a kind of global panel that discusses what how we, we how we distribute things? I don't I don't think that's an answer for one person to make or mm. for the makers of the vaccine. I think it's precisely why we need international bodies to be talking to each other. I think it's certainly going to be a difficult question for whoever does have to answer it. Um, so, a question from Amelia here. Um, thank you. For well, I think if you had the eighteen-year-old and the African. But what was who was the, what was the other example? Uh, those sorry, people an sitting, child or an eighty-year-old Brit. Right. So if you had them plus everybody else, I mean, a lot of other representatives talking about it, I think you get to answer them what you expect. Mm -hmm. Um. So yes, Amelia says uh, thank you for the fascinating lecture. Please, can you return to one of your earlier points about the impact of taking the therapy space online? What has been your experience of interacting with patients outside the therapy room? Well, I haven't been interacting with them outside the therapy room. I, I do my Zoom sessions inside my therapy room. I sit in my chair and they have exactly the same view of me um, uh, as I do. What's been different is we had to learn how to do it. Um, as I said, the most important thing for me was to turn myself off so that I was actually not distracted at all. Um, and the second aspect was to be able to allow people to look away from the screen themselves, just as they, as, just as they do in, in therapy. Uh, for some people, it's made the work really, it's deepened it, and for some people, they've, they've there's a bit of chat at the beginning about how okay I am as well as how okay they are at the kind of conversational level. But otherwise, it's been, it's been therapy as usual. It's kind of interesting seeing people, people's houses and where they're living and, and the fact they've got to keep children out of the room or, or whatever. So for them, for me, it's very different to see them in their surroundings. But I don't know how different it is them to see me on screen. Mm, I definitely agree. I think seeing people's houses being one of the weirdest things about all of this. Um, so we've just got two questions left. Um, so uh, first of all, from Sophia. Um, yeah, even I though I will. Hi. <laughs> um, should I just finish up the last couple of questions? Um, even though we don't have an easy language for emotional life, what diction do you think we will use after the pandemic ends? You mean there'll be a post post pandemic NW seventeen dialect? Is that what they mean? Is that what the question means? I, think, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I think in in what way will our yeah I suppose our language our communication change? I don't know, but it would be it's a very good opportunity for a bit, bit of emotional literacy. I mean, we learn the ABCs, but we have not learned the words for our feelings very well. We either mm -hmm. 
thousands of words. Poets can do it, writers can do it, musicians can do it. We really need to, people can paint it. We really need to have the words, many different words that might express sorrow, grief, sadness, dismay, upset, fear, all the, we need the thesaurus in order to express the subtlety of what we're feeling. To be able to hear what other people are feeling. Um, and then last question uh, here from Nicholas. I think this is a nice one to end on. Um, you've talked a lot about bodies and economics and politics. What about two other elements of human society, community and spirituality? Uh. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I wasn't meaning to exclude community because I think what I'm feeling hurt about is that we are one big community, but we're also excluded from feeling part of it at the same time. I mean, I think it's, that's why we're all Watching, some of us are watching the news or trying to watch the same kind of um, uh, programs. I think it's a big loss. I think absolutely huge. And spirituality comes in many different forms. Spirituality comes from feeling understood or feeling you're part of a global story. There, it doesn't only come through religion. And, and I think that the formal spiritual practices have been actually pretty wonderful this time and then the informal ones like meditation or newer forms have also taken up huge amounts of bandwidth on issue which has been really interesting but I think the loss of, of an ordinary community of people is very very hard I think it's just been absolutely awful that you can't yes. just have a friendly touch or whatever it is a, a non-interesting conversation with your greengrocer that is part of being part of the community. That is part of the loss. And I'm really looking forward to that. Again, if I'm ever allowed out, I don't think I will because I'm in the wrong age group. But if I ever am allowed out, that's what I want to have is a few superficial conversations. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, I'm sorry to anyone if, if your question hasn't been answered. Um, I think I've got through all of them. Uh, and I'll, I'll head off now and I'll hand over to Will. Um, and yeah, you two can wrap up. <laughs> Well, no, I'm, I'm, um, am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Do you look, Susie, um, first of all, I mean, a big thank you. I mean, I, uh, you know, both for preparing the, the lecture, which is, you know, that was a big lecture and it took, uh, covered a lot of ground and you did a lot of spade work. So thank you for that. But also thank you uh, for a couple more things, actually, which I, you know, I've known you a long time, but, um, you know, you're, you're, what I love about you is intellectual bravery. You know, I mean, you just, you just call it as you see it. And if you don't know the answer, if you think it's the wrong question, you tell somebody um, and stand your ground. Um, I like that a lot. It's really, it's really uh, admirable. And you, and you make connections there uh, that actually, um, I mean, you make connections. Um, and I, I know your books do all of that, but I mean, you did it um, for us this afternoon. Um, and also, I thought it was it was you know to try to take on you know everything from you know the European Union through the new normal through the uh, the cosmet the, the the body cosmetics industry uh, <laughs> and try and uh, and link it all and make sense of it um, you know very stimulating very interesting so look a big thank you um, yeah. and actually I thought I thought your last remark about the stillness or the penultimate remarks about the stillness really struck home. Um, I am going to um, now go and have a glass of wine in the quad um, and enjoy the stillness. I hope you enjoy the stillness where you are. But thank you very much. And thank you also everybody um, for zooming in on our, um, uh, what I hope will be, um, given all that Susie's said, our last, uh, our first and last Zoom John Tan lecture. Thank you very much, Susie. Thank you. And thank you very, very much for inviting me too. Thank you. Okay. And thank you to the development office. <laughs> and to all of you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, development team. Thank you, for, you know, thank you for your skills in, uh, in in kind of putting it together and your skill and also the IT team have been on hand as well. Okay. It's time we can end, I think. Um, okay, we can have our wine now. We can have our wine now. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Okay. Bye. Cheers. All right. Bye.